I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to the 48th anniversary celebrations of the Women's Ordination Conference. Uh, my name is Kate McAuley, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Women's Ordination Conference. And along with my colleague and Program Director, Katie Lace, and the WALK National Board of Directors, we would like to thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to invite Katie to first lead us in an opening prayer. Thank you, Kate. And to begin tonight, this prayer is an adaptation of a prayer written, be, written by Rosalie Muskell Reinhardt in 1975 as a part of a liturgy of invocation for the first conference. So I have adapted some of the language to reflect our gathering today. And as we begin, let's remember that the God who was present then at that first mm -hmm. conference is present with us now. My siblings, let us offer our words to the living word. O oh, ever-living, ever-loving, and ever-unfolding God, you have called us by name, and we have claimed our name. We are the people of God. We celebrate this anniversary and claim our fierce urgency as an act of faith, hope, and love in you and in the community of the people of God. We come because we must. We have heard your good news. What has been created here was promised centuries ago by the prophet Joel. In the days to come, says our God, I will pour out my spirit on all humankind. Your children of all genders shall prophesy. Your youth shall see visions. Your elders shall dream dreams. Yes, the Holy Spirit shall come upon all my servants, women, men, people of all genders, and they shall prophesy. We ask you now to continue to fulfill that promise. Mm -hmm. Embrace with your spirit all those persons who have brought the Women's Ordination Conference to this moment. Enliven with your spirit those who minister to this community with a variety of gifts woven together at the tapestry of your grace. Draw us together in your spirit with our beloved ancestors, the wise women who have gone before us, and with those who cannot be with us tonight, but who are nonetheless present. Touch each of us. Enable us to speak with your will written on our hearts and our minds, so that we may joyfully and fearlessly speak the prophecy. We praise you, for you are a God of love and mercy. We thank you, for the gift of love and life in Jesus the Christ. We claim our power through your Holy Spirit, one God who lives forever in the hearts of all people. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Rosalie. The theme of this year's anniversary is a timely and tricky one synodality, and the fierce urgency of equality, the call for women's ordination now. Our theme refers to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s prophetic phrase, the fierce urgency of now, which he spoke on August 28, 1963 at the Lincoln Memorial during his famous I Have a Dream speech and continue to use after. As you know, Walk has accepted Pope Francis's invitation to journey towards a more synodal church. And we ensured the voices from the grassroots, the voices of Walk members were centered, amplified and received in Rome this past October. 
Through creative, bold, and spirit-filled witnesses, we work to enlarge the synodal tent to truly include those most marginalized by our church. And yet, for many here, and poignantly as we mark our 48th year of the Women's Ordination Conference, the mm. pace of synodality feels too slow to truly attend to the injustices of patriarchy, misogyny, colonialism, racism, and sexism. How do we hold this dynamic tension with authenticity, hope, and the fierce urgency of now? So we'll explore these themes throughout the weekend with activists, theologians, synod delegates, and all of you. The questions we ask, is our, ask of ourselves are not easy ones and yet walks steady, persistent, creative, bold, and uncompromising attention to the call for women's ordination now is something to celebrate. So we arrive today on the shoulders of those visionary and courageous members of the first organizing task force mm -hmm. and the collective energy of the more than 1,200 people who gathered Thanksgiving weekend in 1975 to claim their ministerial mm -hmm. equality and embark on a path of renewal and hope. We honor the faith-filled and fearless leaders who took up the torch for walk and marched, prayed, chanted, and challenged male-dominated spaces and structures, not just as skilled activist, activists, but as feminists, murista, and womanist theologians, ministers, lobbyists, insiders and outsiders, and modern day prophets. And we honor all those who are just discovering and finding new ways to live into the fierce, rich, and feminist living legacy of the Women's Ordination Conference and making it their own home. Tonight, we open our gala with stories and testimonies from leaders who know walk in a very special way. So I wanna say thank you to Amira, to Jane, to Mary, and to Joan for being with us tonight uh, in their own way. And in, in a few minutes, we will begin our roundtable conversation. But first, we'll start with a quick um, slideshow of a walk down memory lane which we focus on the first few years of the Women's Ordination Conference and the last few years of our movement. Mm -hmm.
obviously that's a very abbreviated uh, walk down memory lane, um, but we thought it was poignant to sort of share our early years and the past few years. Um, so now it's my honor to introduce our panelists for this evening. Uh, we're joined by some very incredible women. Uh, Joan Sabala is a sister of St. Joseph of Rochester, New York, and served on the walk, board, walk office ministerial team from 1979 until 1982, along with Ada Maria Asasi Diaz and Rosalie Musal Reinhardt. And she's also a founding member of Rapport, which is Renewing and Priestly People, Ordination Reconsidered Today, which is born out of the 1985 Walk Conference and continues today committed to the struggle for the long haul. Unfortunately, Jane Varner Malhortra can't join us this evening, but she is the niece of the late Anne Patrick, who attended the first Women's Ordination Conference and um, the niece of Mary Patrick, who will be joining us this evening as Jane rests. Nevertheless, we lift up Jane as a gifted communicator, storyteller, and community organizer. She currently works in the Office of Advancement at Georgetown University. In 2019, she co-founded with Mary, who's with us tonight, the Washington Home Inclusive Monthly Mass, or WIM, organizing home liturgies led by Roman Catholic women priests to make visible the active ministry and call of women. We're also joined by Sister Mary McGlone, uh, a sister of St. Joseph of Cardinet, the Cardinalette of Denver, who attended the first Women's Ordination Conference in 1975. Since then, she has ministered in Colorado, Wisconsin, Missouri, Inca, and Puno, Peru as well as serving as a theological consultant and friend to the sister of St. Basil of the Great in Romania for nearly 30 years. She currently serves on the congregational leadership team of her congregation and is based in St. Louis. And Amira Orcazo is a PhD student in the theology department of Notre Dame with a subdiscipline of systematic theology. Uh, she is originally from the border between El Paso and Juarez, she comes to academic theology through questions of liberation and emancipation of the poor and marginalized. She is most interested in feminist as well as decolonial theologies. And her doctoral thesis at Notre Dame uh, focuses on feminist movements in the Catholic Church and how they relate to social movements outside of the church and why that relationship is important to understanding the role of the church in public life. So Amira is not with us tonight because she is uh, attending the American Academy of Religion meetings that are happening, but we have a very special video from her that we'll watch now. I was born a feminist on Thanksgiving weekend, 1975, when over 1,000 Roman Catholic women met, met to insist on women's rights to be ordained to a renewed priestly ministry in our church. Failing, as the overwhelming majority of human beings do, to remember my bodily birth, I am privileged enough to remember every detail of this birth to the struggle for liberation. These words were written by Ada Maria Isasi Diaz. Ada was a Cuban Catholic woman and the founder of Mujerista Theology, a feminist theology that focuses its efforts and analysis on the daily lives, lo cotidiano, of impoverished Latina women. Ada spent time amongst the world's poor in Lima, Peru, and in various parts of the United States. Although she had a master's in medieval studies and both a master's and doctoral degree in theology, and taught at Drew University for many years, it was the world's poor who provided Ada with her richest sources for theology. It was the poor of the world who brought her closer to God and gave her hope for the church. Ada's commitment to the poor is intimately wrapped up in her mujerista theology, intermingled with an understanding that the liberation of women is not an option in the total economic, spiritual, and material liberation but a requirement. 
as she herself stated it, it was the issue of women's ordination that brought her into the manifold movements of liberation that she would spend her years afterwards, up until her death, deeply involved in. In 1976, she met Yolanda Tarango at a call to action per conference. The two women would go on to write the first iteration of Mujerista theology in a book published in 1992. It was Yolanda who invited Ada to be part of Las Hermanas, an organization of Latina women who were most active in the 1970s and 80s. Although Mary B. Lynch, founder of Women's Ordination Conference, had already invited Las Hermanas to be a part of their organization before Ada joined, it was still this dual membership in these two groups for Ada, sometimes overlapping and at other times painful and contradictory that formed her and formed her theology. Women's ordination remained a central issue for her in her written words and action. In 1985, at the third National Encuentro for Hispanic Ministry, it was Ada who staged a resistance after the committee members would not allow a vote to take place on the language of support for women's ordination in the final document. She gathered women to pray the rosary outside of the National Cathedral. While the language of the final document fell short of a support for women's ordination, Ada's organization of a resistance remains a potent memory in the history of our church. Another, um, another moment where women did not allow the reality of a slow moving church to stop them from demanding equality now. Ada was not really prone to waiting for the Vatican or the bishops to give her permission at all. Beginning in 2007, Ada ministered with a community in New York City that had lost a priest due to parish closings. She took up the charge with grace and began preaching and ministering in a way only one called by the Holy Spirit might do. While she remained always Catholic, she never mistook a loyalty to the church with complacency. Ada died almost a full year before Pope Francis was elected. But sometimes, and together with Yolanda Tarango, who remained her best friend until the moment she died, and sometimes alone while I'm reading and write, writing about her and reading her, I like to imagine what that would have changed for her, what Pope Francis would have changed for her, what she could have done and could have been with a pope who has opened the church in the way that Francis has. I like to imagine what she would have commented on the Synod on Synodality's final document. Now, her key understanding of liberation and one of her biggest contributions to theology was the idea of lo cotidiano, the quotidian, the everyday life. She argues that it is the everyday life of impoverished Latina women that provide the key to understanding whether progress is being made. I hope you all had the privilege to sit in on some of the synodal listening sessions at some point over the last few years of this process, as this process has been going on. In my experience, they were showings of the very thing Ada knew to be true. The everyday experience of a religion and spiritualities matter. The wisdom we can garner from these quotidians, these cotidianos, is important for theologizing. To theologize without being attuned to that to theorize without understanding this is to ignore the very mission of the church. Francis, in my opinion, has shown us that he agrees. In a document published a few weeks ago, Francis argues that theology ought to have what he calls an inductive method, meaning that it must start from grassroots realities. He argues that it ought to be connected to real lives and real people. He calls this the quote unquote pastoral stamp of all theology. In my reading, the final document of the Synod made an, advance, ad, an advancement in the church's understanding of the weak points of the priesthood as it is now articulated. The document calls out clericalism for what it is, a chauvinist mentality. However, with Ava's contributions in mind, we cannot help to, but think to ourselves what change does this really make? Where in the church is change happening that attends to the daily realities of women, to the daily needs of the church, to the incarnated, enfleshed realities of the people of God? 
Now, certainly there's a lot to be said by the way this historic process included women and their voices, and the final document spoke many truths when it spoke of women. But as women's ordination gets passed down, gets for another group and another research organization, I think Ada would have agreed with us all here that the time for equality is now. As we celebrate the anniversary of that historical day in 1975, when Roman Catholic women met in Detroit, we also celebrate Ada Maria Isacia Diaz's birth into the struggle for liberation. We celebrate the way her own conviction and her own calling through the Holy Spirit led her to serve God's people and minister with the world's poor. I am grateful for her life and honored to live in her legacy as we continue in the struggle for liberation. I'm sorry that I could not be there with you all today, but I am praying for you as you celebrate in fiesta this historical moment in our church's history. Ada Maria Isasi Diaz, presente. Thank you, Amira. Um, such a rich contribution to our tapestry as a movement. So I'm so glad we could share that little slice of our early days and one of our early founders. So now it's my privilege to invite some of the women who are here this evening uh, to share their own stories of walk. Um, and um, I think it's a it's a feminist act to share testimony and story uh, as women in the Catholic Church. And so I invite Sister Joan and Sister Mary um, as our keynote speakers tonight to share um, how did you come to walk? Or or maybe a better question is, how did you come back to the Women's ah. Education Conference? Um, so maybe Joan, you could start and then we'll, we'll follow with Mary. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much, Kate. And I'm so pleased to be with all of you around the country and where else you are. Uh, in my remarks tonight, I want to focus on pre-WAC and my early years and our early years in WAC. I'm doing it this way because uh, the early years of WAC leadership were led by some women whose names you've already heard. So Ruth McDonough Fitzpatrick, Ada Maria Isasi Diaz, uh, Rosalie Michelle Reinhardt uh, and I were the first four that were members of the office ministerial team. The other four, the other three have already gone over, they've crossed over into eternal life. And at 83, I'm the only one left. So it behooves me to tell not only my story, but also foundational stories. Although, quite frankly, I'm going to end up leading, leaving out a lot more than I can say in a few minutes. And Kate very nicely gave us <clears throat> guide, guiding questions so that we won't go overboard or over time. Uh, the taste, the taste for the compelling character of the women's movement Church uh, was in the very air we breathed in Rochester. After all, we were the home of Susan B. Anthony, mm -hmm. and just down the throughway was uh, Seneca Falls, where the Women's Rights Convention was held in 1848. So as we lived and did our ordinary things, we came to be very much engrossed in the women's movement that was emerging in our church. And some of us found one another. We became a group that focused on education and advocacy. And uh, we did prayer services and retreats. We even launched a newspaper, which we called New Women, New Church. And if that sounds familiar to you, it's because later women, New Women, New Church was purchased by WAC for a dollar or so. And uh, it became the clarion uh, 
place where we heard the stories of Women's Ordination Conference over all of these years. And one of the women who was an important part of our group in Rochester was, of course, Ada Maria Isasi Diaz. So it was natural that all of us who could went to Detroit in 1975 for the first conference on the ordination of women. And I want to mention three things that were my experience there at the time. The conference was inspired by a woman named Mary B. Lynch. Her name is kind of passed over very quickly. She was in her later years when she earned a divinity degree uh, from the seminary in Cincinnati. And in her 74 Christmas card to Mary, Mary many uh, women friends, Mary wondered, was it not time to call the question about the ordination of women. Shrewd Mary, as women responded and yes, we should do this, they became the steering committee for the conference. Now here's an interesting fact about that steering committee. Only women religious responded. And looking at the list, insightful Mary, contacted Rosaline Michelle Reinhardt, a married woman of mother of four who had likewise earned a divinity degree. Rosalie, Mary said, you need to be on the steering committee. Rosalie swallowed hard, thinking of herself as inadequate, but she took one step forward, never looked back. You heard the power of her prayer that Katie read for us mm -hmm. as we began today. And so she also became a WAC leader. The second point about that event uh, is that fully 80 to 90% of the women who stood at the conference to be acknowledged as experiencing a call to ordination were women religious. By 1978, at the even larger second conference on the ordination of women in Baltimore, guess what? Most of the participants and people who took leadership roles were single or married. And the third thing, of course, was that the 1975 conference, we've already heard this, was call, called for the establishment of a national organization to guide the issue into the future. So then everybody went home to Turkey if there was any left. Yeah. Ruth Fitz, Fitz, McDonough Fitzpatrick of suburban Washington was willing to run the office from the garage of their family home. That's our humble beginning. Abe Lincoln had a log cabin. We had the garage <laughs> of Ruth McDonough Fitzpatrick's home. So for a few years at the beginning, and then again from 75 to 85, uh, Ruth, fearless leader of our group. And I want to tell you something about those early years. They were arduous. Very little money no way to gather and keep comprehensive lists of contact information for like-minded women, no office staff, conflicting views of process. It is a gift of God that we survived. One thing was there from the very beginning and it persists to this day. The women of Women's Ordination Conference did not want to be ordained and simply inserted into the current clerical system. The call, the desire was for new women, new church, new disciples in priestly ministry. And this is the backstory of WAC. That changed. Mm -hmm. We've been that and we continue to be that. And we believe that 
this is our calling. There was a period in the 80s when I was frankly personally worried that WAC would become so general in our quest to embrace mm. women's issues that we would water down our primary focus. Thank God that hasn't happened. And if anything, we've become stronger by virtue of not only our leadership, but our membership as well. The third conference on the ordination of women in 1985 was held in St. Louis. Get this. The venue was the Henry VIII Hotel. Now that's a laugh. A smaller conference, it offered participants a process for discussion that quite frankly didn't grab us. Hmm. So during the morning break, fellow Rajasterian Nancy Dericki and I called into an alcove anyone who really wanted to be more intently focused on the ordination issue. And 60 people came into that alcove and 30 came next year to uh, Rochester. Uh, so that was 1986. And that was the beginning of a subgroup of WAC, not, not, not a breakaway. It was a subgroup of WAC called Rapport, Ec Renewing and Priestly People, Ordination Reconsidered Today. So we've been in, in community within WAC now for 37 years. People mm -hmm. have come and gone. We've had permeable boundaries and we have had some experiences. If I had three hours, I'd tell you about them, but we don't. So this is what I want to say to you. You and your WAC membership might want to <clears> gather <throat> and support one another's call in a more intimate way by gathering in a community that has a future. If you don't have such a group already, go for it. Working together is the only way that we can go forward. Early on, Dominican sister Marjorie Tuit, a skilled teacher in strategy and tactics, opened her large boned hand and gestured in a way that supported these words. She told us, never, ever go to power alone. Go together. So finally, I want to honor and thank all the women who have served in WAC leadership over the years. Not limited to these, but I just want to call out Marcy Silvestro, musical artist who gave WAC our anthem, Bless You, My Sisters. Thank you, Andrea Johnson and Kate McElwee, who've been with us through critical times. Everyone who has worked in WAC leadership so that we might continue to listen to the Holy Spirit's beckoning. For Kate and for Hall, who have produced this 48th anniversary celebration, heartfelt thanks. And listen, this is a final word that comes to all of you zooming in tonight. Pay attention. I am standing with you, and I am sending you all the encouragement I possibly can. There is work to do, hearts to stir, calls to be awakened, God's people to serve and enliven. God bless us on our way. Thank you so much, Joan. It's such a, I, I feel like I had a shot in the arm with that. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, and I'm, I'm honored also to welcome Sister Mary here uh, to share a little bit about her journey to walk as a, as a person who attended the first conference and has found her way back now, 48 years later. So welcome, Sister Mary, and thank um, you. Uh, take it away. I want to echo your thank you to Joan. What a, what a compact history you gave us and a reminder of so many of the important values that, that 
that we hold together and want to promote. Um, one of the things that uh, Kate asked was, how did you come to walk? You know, I really can't remember how I found out about the first conference. My guess is it might have been the NCR, but I don't know. Um, there weren't many other things that we're talking about it anyway. Um, and so I asked, I, it was 1975, and I had made first vows less than a year before that. And uh, that puts you in a kind of ask for help, ask for permission position. And it's really, to me, pretty amazing that our our leadership said, yes, go, you know, and paid for it. Um, but maybe that was something about the, the spirit of the community, uh, the vision, uh, but it was, uh, it was amazing and a phenomenal experience for me. Um, I remember, I think one of the first things that just shot at me was the, the pin that a lot of people were sporting that said, ordain women or stop baptizing them. And that was that, you know, that, that was not that common an idea in 1975, but it was, it was startling and it, it threw me, I think, into new ways of thinking. Um, so ordained women, I, I had felt called to priesthood since I was about five, I think. Uh, and of course, you know, just like my older brother said, girls don't get to wear red shoes. Uh, he told me girls don't get to be ordained. I bought red shoes, but <laughs> the other part didn't come through yet, yet. But what went on, I'm going to share a little bit more of my, my own journey because I don't have anything like the institutional knowledge that many of you probably had, and certainly Joan. Um, I began to think that if this was a true vocation, there would be a way to live it out. And so that became sort of my quest. How can I, in, in a church that's not going to see it in any formal way, how can I live this out? And the other thing that really struck me at that, what was I, 27 years old? Maybe not even that. Uh, what struck me was that um, it just flew out of my mind. Um, it, that if it was the vocation, then there'd be a way to do it. And so instead of remaining very institutionally involved, I started ex exploring other kinds of ministry, you know, uh, campus ministry. And then a few years later, uh, I had the opportunity to go and serve with our sisters in Peru. Uh, and that was right up my alley. We were in priestless parishes where the sisters did everything except consecrate. Um, and it was just wonderful. And I served first, uh, in the desert coast, uh, and then in the mountains, uh, in the department of Puno. Uh, and after about a year in Puno, I was invited to teach in the seminary. I had had a, I came to, to uh, Peru with a master's degree in theology. And as I taught, what I realized was I was preparing guys from the culture, they, they were both Aymaras and Quechuas, the indigenous cultures in the mountains. And I didn't have that culture. As, as I would say to them, you grew up seeing the world from your mother's back. And I grew up seeing my mother hold me face to face. We've got a totally different way of looking at the world. And although I loved the ministry we were doing, the, it, all of it, the weddings, the funerals, the baptisms, the services, it finally, I finally realized that while I've got that call to priesthood, it wasn't really in Peru. 
And I think one of the people that helped me get that was a young guy named Lucho Zambrano. Uh, he had gotten kicked out of the seminary in Lima because of something he put up on a bulletin board and came up to Puno, which is a very poor area, and began to just minister to people. And when, was, when he was asked, are you going to get ordained, Lucho? He said, when the people ask me. And about five or six years later, the people asked him, and he got ordained. But I thought, that's right. In order to really be a minister, you've got to be the one that the people ask. And then, and coming back to the U.S., what dawned on me was how many ways women were already acting out this vocation without the formal ordination. Um, and the people were asking for it. The women's ministries just flourished in, in these 48 years, you know, uh, formally, informally. And it's, I think we were, one of the things that I got when they, at the first ordination conference, when they said, don't, we don't want to enter into the clericalism, into the priesthood as it is now. We need to change it in order to make it a real ministerial priesthood and not um, a status, a service, not a status. Um, but you could see how women were changing things from the ground level up. Uh, one of our great bishops from Colorado had he had sisters on his, he was a pastor of a parish as well. And he had sisters on the staff. And he, he sat down with us and he said, you know, when I do communion calls, I get in there and I maybe hear the confession. I talk for a minute. I say some prayers. I uh, share a communion and I go. He said, the, the sisters are taking like an hour per visit. And he said, I realized that's what it ought to be, you know? So uh, that's, I think we're opening the thing up in ways that, that the guys are not being prepared to do for sure. And that's probably coming from the struggle. Uh, when we heard in the, the first sharing about the, the dedication to the poor, I thought, yeah, the poor show us how to hang in how to live in hope and generosity, generosity beyond compare. The poor know how to invent new ways of doing things when the system doesn't work. They, they, they find a way to do the impossible. And I think, I think that's piece of how we're opening things up, meeting the people, learning from the people, uh, not being the answer people. So that's that was kind of where my journey went, not into the instant, not into the organizational, but into various kinds of practice. Uh, and uh, when I think about what I would say, what's changed about walk was exactly what Joan said, the increased number of women who were not women religious, but calling for the same thing. Um, and the advice I think I'd come through with would be to say, uh, we've got to do, I think this is out of my profession, but we've got to do our theological homework. Um, it, I always remember when John Paul said, the church does not have the authority to ordain women. I fully agree, but it doesn't have the authority to ordain men either. Jesus never did anything like that. So anything new can happen. So that's that's sort of the story of my journey. And thank you. There you are. Thank you so much. I mean, you're two women who were at the early early days of walk, and I could listen to you for days. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story. It just is a sliver of the richness of our of our movement. Mm -hmm. um, so Sister Mary, you spoke a little bit about what has changed and maybe what hasn't changed about WALK, but I want to throw that question to you, Joan. Um, from your perspective, is there something about WALK that 
has changed that gives you hope or perhaps what hasn't changed that gives you hope? Yeah. The largest way in which I can answer that is to say the newbies on the block, you and the others who have come forth. And there are many, many, many more out there who are moved by the spirit of Jesus and don't see themselves entering into a church that has uh, been so oppressive. So that's the thing. It, it's been there right along. Whenever we've needed new people in <clears throat> the Women's Ordination Conference, new people have been there, not only in leadership, but also in membership. And it's terribly important. So you go for it. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to invite Mary Patrick here for our last mm. question. Um, for all of you, I mean, I think the question is really, is there an advice or example or witness from a walk ancestor that you'd like to share with us tonight. And I want to start with you, Mary. Um, thank you for being here in Jane's place uh, in some ways. Um, as an ancestor and sister of Anne Patrick, I, I just want to give you opportunity uh, to, to share some of her wisdom and your own wisdom about the movement. And then we'll go around to the other, other women here. Thank you, Kate, for including me tonight. Um, yes, Jane and I walk hand in hand. She tends, well, I mean, not hand in hand. I, I kind of hold her up from the back, and stand behind her. I'm, she's the communicator. I'm the quiet one in the back. But I am uh, the youngest sister of Anne Patrick, um, who I who was instrumental um, at the very beginning of of walk. Um, and I, I do want to read something from her book. Um, those of you, most of you probably know she passed away in 2016 and I published her up. Oh, you can't read it because I've blurred, but her book on um, a collection of her hmm. essays and many people have read it. Um, people who were not present um, at, at in the early days and have commented how some of her writings from the 60s and the 70s are so appropriate today and how it the book really does give give hope um one of the articles is about i think it made it in the book but she did write an article on the um permanent diaconate she was active in that movement and uh, for the men so we 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 know change happens yeah. and so this book gives us hope so i want to read um uh from one of her essays in this book um, this essay was written in 1975. It is, it's called A Conservative Case for the Ordination of Women. And here's what Anne wrote, part of what she wrote. Many creative and beautiful things are going on in ministry today, and it hardly makes sense to leave them on the periphery of the church's structure. Mary B. Lynch, who heads the US section of the International Association of Women aspiring to Presbyterian ministry. The European branch is led by 79 year old Dominican sister Valentine Bousseret has stated in regard to women's ordination that service and leadership within the authoritative church will be increasingly affirmed with the clarification of roles as they are really practiced today. Mm. Catholics with a sense of tradition will probably be glad to learn that it was to the US bishops that a group calling itself Ordination Conference Task Force first appealed for spiritual, moral, and financial support in their efforts to organize a national meeting for next fall on the theme, Women in Future Priesthood Now, a call to action. The task force comprising representatives of seven Roman Catholic seminaries, eight national Catholic organizations, and 11 congregations of women religious 
seeks not to undermine church order, but rather to convene persons who are committed to making the talents of women fully available for ministerial service in the Roman Catholic Church and to inform the church about women preparing for a new expression of full priesthood. Although many Catholics may be surprised to learn that women are enrolled in some seminaries now, the news should be encouraging to those who have come to value not only church order and sacraments, but women as well. It is symbolic, I believe, that the task force has chosen to use the National Center for Church Vocations, 305 North Michigan Avenue, Detroit, Michigan, 48226, in case you want to drop them a line, as its mailing address. Anne goes on to write, although it would be a mistake to assume that admitting women to sacramental orders will of itself eliminate the vocation crisis, I am convinced that this reform will at least contribute toward improving the situation. The principal reason for this is that ordination will mean the full acceptance of women into the sacramental life of the church. And this symbolic gesture of welcome is bound to touch the hearts of women who, thanks to the women's movement, are growing increasingly conscience, conscious of their dignity as persons. Paradoxical as it may seem, by changing one non-doctrinal aspect of the tradition, the church stands to gain in many vital ways. On the other hand, the effects of not including women in full sacramental and hierarchical ministries of the Catholic community are bound to be negative for the institutional church. And Anne concludes with this. At this juncture, I can only hope that the institution will respond to the challenge facing it, that it will hear the voice of the spirit inviting the Catholic community to grow to a state of maturity where all gifts are equally respected. The stakes involved are too substantial for the church to attempt to avoid this issue. At the 1971 Synod of Bishops, Patriarch Maximus Hakim of Antioch reminded the church leaders of an important truth. Once women announced the good news to Peter. If we listen to them again today, women may have something to tell us. That was written in 1975. Thank you, Mary. Our prayer is that that is not evergreen, but today it is. Um, so thank you for bringing Anne Patrick into our conversation as a foremother of the movement. And um, thank you for the work that you do on the grassroots and parish level through WIM in Washington, DC. Um, you're truly living into her legacy. So an honor to have you here with us. Thank um, you. It's an honor to meet you. I want to include Joan and Mary in this final question about um, an example or a witness or a story of a walk ancestor that you want to share that maybe you haven't touched on before, a piece of wisdom that might offer hope to those newbies on the block or those who have been around the block uh, for a few decades that, that could that could inspire us in this moment. I can't help thinking of um, Marcy Silvestro in this regard. Uh, you'd have to know Marcy to know uh, her power of music and art, but um, we had met her someplace along the way. You know, one of the things that we, we started to do early on was make phone calls around the country to see if we can talk with people, women, uh, to see if they could find groups to work with in their local areas. I mean, we were just groping. Well, one of the people we came 
across was was Marcy. And she was so appealing and she would have been such a good successor for some of us uh, who needed to move on for a variety of reasons. And so, um, but Marcy didn't know whether she wanted to, to, to take on this job. And so she, she prayed to the Holy Spirit and she wasn't getting anywhere. And she was on the street running one day. And this man came toward her running in the opposite direction. And he had on a t-shirt that said, I'd rather be in Rochester. <laughs> and so that's why she came, believe it or not. She had that sense of adventure and she offered us a great service. So when people's artistic talents uh, can be brought into our ministry, what it tells the world is we're happy people and that's terribly important. Thank you, Joan. Joy is a huge part of this and I know my outreach committee on the walk board is, is championing what you're saying <laughs> right now uh, as they make bu bumper stickers and t-shirts. Um, this is like, it's all to the good, so thank you. And Mary, I, just a final pearl of wisdom from you. Yeah, well, as I've said, I I didn't maintain contact with the history of the the movement, with the leaders of the movement. Uh, but when I thought about what could I say here, I would say that it's all the members, all the women who have and men, who have worked and prayed and lived into new paradigms. That are that are our source of hope, um, and, and I was just thinking, it's bold, it's fierce hope, and that won't that won't get stopped. So I, I say, everybody. Thank you. Bold, fierce hope never goes out of style. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Joan and Mary and Mary for being with us uh, this evening and all of you. Um, I want to invite back to the conversation my colleague Katie, who is going to sort of model a, a toast to walk and, and that invitation goes to all of you um, to offer a toast or a benediction or, or just gratitude to the movement. Um, so I'm going to invite Katie here to lead us in that. Thank you. So as we, as we prepare to toast, you know, if you have a, a glass of wine, a glass of tea, a glass of a, a mug of tea, a glass of water, uh, whatever you have around you, um, whatever you'd like to raise uh, joyfully as we celebrate walk, uh, I'd like to offer our first toast. Here's to courageous women, to priestly people, to the noisy movement, to the ministers of irritation, to the prophetic people, to feminist ministers, to women and people of all genders asking questions and resisting easy answers. Cheers. And we now invite any of you who would like to unmute and offer a word, either a, a toast or a benediction for us, uh, as you prefer, uh, we would invite you to do that. I would like to say slancha to your health, to, to walk, and to all the wonderful women who have come before us. Um, thank you so much, Mary and Joan, and all the others who have shared your stories. I would just like to say thank you for all that you've done and it's done so much for the, not only for the movement, but for individuals within it. It's given me the courage through some difficult times in my faith life. So thank you and slancha. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy serves on the walk board currently based in Pennsylvania. Thank you. I would like to raise a toast uh, to the light within each of you. You are all light that shines brightly. Um, I'm from Canada, uh, the Bishop for RCWP Canada, and I salute you all for the work that you do. It gives us inspiration and courage. Blessings. Thank you. 
to all. Thank you, Jane. I had to Google what benediction meant, and I think it means prayer. Um, <laughs> so, um, Jesus, thank you for um, just being with us today. Thank you for letting me find this conference. I've been feeling kind of lonely um, in the Catholic world. Uh, I feel like I'm too verbal. <laughs> But then I find out that every nun I talk to is very liberal, too. I love it. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, just thank you for walking, uh, giving me a sense of community. Thank you so much, Anna. We're so glad that you're you're with us and part of our community. So welcome. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'd like to lift up uh, Mercedes Iannone, who was my graduate advisor and who let me take seven years to get my master's degree in theology with five children and who supported me the whole time. And um, because of her, I I'm still here today, especially since she said you have to wait until the structure changes. And now I see the structure is changing and I just thank you all for that. And I think Mercedes, please lift, lift your glasses. Mercedes, I am on. I'd like to toast Mary Lynch and tell you something you might not know. We went to the seminary together and Mary called every day we had an eight o'clock class to get me up for my eight o'clock class. <laughs> so to Mary Lynch. <laughs> Cheers to persistent women. Well, I just wanna say thank you all. I'm sure that the gratitude will continue throughout the weekend. And um, it's a, a pleasure and really an honor to be with you all on this path towards justice. So thank you for, being part of this sort of informal and, and very special gathering of the legacy of Women's Ordination Conference. Um, thank you for being here. So throughout the weekend, we are happy to offer the rest of the, all of the gala events are free. Um, so please just make sure to register for live conversations like the one today. Um, and of course, the this work and our ministry and the shepherding of walk are are not without value. So just at, as you're considering and thinking about this giving season, please consider walk um, in your end of the year giving, uh, especially around our anniversary. Um, and when you support walk like you are by being here tonight, uh, you join a long legacy of women who followed the example and ministry of Jesus, who go and tell the good news of equality. You are part of the urgent, visible, dialogical, theological, and prophetic movement that is truly transforming the church. So thank you for your generosity this evening and over the decades, and particularly at this critical moment in our church. Thank you for keeping walk moving along the path to equality and thank you for keeping walk strong. Um, so Katie has put up the schedule for the rest of the weekend. Tomorrow we'll be sharing pre-recorded videos from friends, theologians, um, allies of walk. And then we have three other Zoom events like this that you should have received a link for. If you're here, I'm sure, I hope you have access to these, but we'll have an event at noon with two beautiful theologians, Valerie Lewis Molsey and Flora Tang, who will be talking about sort of our theme, synodality and the fierce urgency of equality, how we hold that tension. Um, and then at 3 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, we'll also have a live conversation with three synod delegates uh, who are part of the synod conversations in Rome, um, about their perspective, uh, advice they have for us going forward, and again, their reflections on our theme of how do we hold this urgency of equality with the pace of synodality, and, and, and hopefully they'll have some wisdom for us. Um, and then throughout the day, we'll be sharing pre-recorded videos 
from friends. Some of them are on this call with us this evening, but including Ruby Alameda from the Global Network of Rainbow Catholics, Greg Boyle from Homeboy Industries, Lizzie Berntegeer, chaplain, leader, amazing woman, uh, Shannon Evans, writer and editor at National Catholic Reporter, the list goes on and on. So please be checking your inbox. Don't unsubscribe. Uh, stick with us this weekend as we share these videos. And then we'll conclude our 48th anniversary celebrations with a very special liturgy on Sunday. If you've registered for this event, you should also have that link, but it includes a co-presided liturgy with Diane Willman, who's a woman priest from South Africa, and Teresa Casilla Fiori, who is a woman I work with in the Catholic Women's Council. She's based in Madrid, but from Argentina. And we have Leslie Colvin, who will be preaching and live music um, from musician Jessica Gerhardt. So it'll be a very, very special conclusion of our weekend. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you to check out the, the auction, the live walk auction that's happening throughout the weekend. Um, many of our board members and, and members have shared their creativity and generosity for the auction. So um, as you consider making an anniversary gift to walk, also think about shopping small this holiday season by shopping the online auction, which is will be live all this weekend. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you for raising your glass and your heart to this very, very special movement. And I'm so honored to be with Sister Mary and Joan who are here um, to bring our, our history is still alive. We're living into history and we're living through history right now in this very special moment. So thank you for being part of it. And it's, it's, this is just the beginning of the weekend. So uh, enjoy. <laughs> And I can't wait to continue to these celebrations. So thank you all.